This episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. We're back with another Dino Doc accuracy review. I wanted to talk about Amazing Dino World 2 and see what that Maip is all about, but can't access it without paying for it on some streaming service. Gosh, can you imagine creators wanting to be paid for their product? Jeez, what kind of sick world is this? Daddy Marks would be so disappointed. Well, I guess this means we're going back to Prehistoric Planet 2, the sequel to probably the most favorite, highest acclaimed paleo documentary from recent years, which, after weighing the evidence, I decided it deserved an A-. Though many fell in love with it, I had a few reservations with both the science and the format, still a very good series overall. Only a year after the original's release in 2022 came another look into life on Earth at the end of the Cretaceous. We're doing a sequel. We're back by popular demand. So, how did the second go around do? Did the science improve to be even better, or is the sequel truly never as good? Well guys, let's dig this up. Before we get into the positives and negatives of this latest season, it should be pointed out that, yeah, we're still in the same time as the first, 66 million years ago, right at the end of the Cretaceous. So, of course, we're gonna see many of the same faces as last time, which also means much of the same quality. Lots of previous compliments return, as well as some problems. Returning from 2022 are several amazing designs that really have become the gold standard of paleo portrayals. They're so good that I can't help but use them in all of my paleontology videos because these are dinosaurs. To our knowledge, most are about as good as you can get. Tyrannosaurus are still as beautiful as ever as they thread the needle through the feather debate with those many small scales causing a leathery appearance along with a very light fuzz over top. Returning viewers may know of Eutyrannus, an earlier and more distant Tyrannosauroid relative that had been found with traces of downy fluff. But on the other hand, closer Tyrannosaurus such as Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Tarbosaurus, and even fragments from T-Rex itself show impression of small scales. In Prehistoric Planet, we get the best of both worlds, which makes sense since the Tyrant Lizard King lived in a much warmer environment and was larger than New Tyrannus, so it didn't have the same need for insulation. However, the smaller, but still too small, Alaskan Nanuxaurus gets a heavier coat. Mosasaurs are still incredible with their forked tongues and soft tissue fin projecting from the tail. They literally are aquatic monitor lizards and we certainly get that. My last review was Fly Monsters, where we saw what to do and what not to do with pterosaurs. Season 2 here nails everything. I mean, this is it. These are real as darkids. Our feathery pterosaurs soar through the skies with their correctly shaped wings, supported by an enlarged fourth finger, that correctly run down the ankle. Once on land, these guys move quadrupedally and are so efficient that they gallop after small terrestrial vertebrates. It is nightmare fuel, I'm surprised no one's made a horror game about this. Trackways do show that they would have moved as such. They were pretty efficient movers on land. Overall, the Triceratops are still really good, even if I was crossing my fingers for some Taurosaurus. Aside from the pointy epicipitals on adults, these would be perfect T. horridus, even if at this time we should be seeing the later species T. prorsus. Our males are clearly inspired by the epic Yoshi specimen with humongous horns. Another Hell Creek Lancian Titan is the classic Edmontosaurus. Along with other and Cretaceous Hadrosaurs, they're still awesome. Those duck bills aren't duck billed, instead having a hard snipping beak at the end. Coupled with some ridges down the midline and still those large hoof-like nails on the front limbs, such designs are still up to date, encapsulating our knowledge of such herbivores. A year after the original, Edmontosaurus still sparks joy. Zalmoxes does not spark joy. In the first trailer, seemingly everyone overlooked it because it's cute. I noted how the proportions looked kind of off and weird, and I think I know why. It's the neck. 
The artist gave Zalmoxis that modern hadrosaur neck where it's chunky and filled with muscle and fat, something akin to Parasaurol Office. But I don't think it really works here with Zalmoxis. David Attenborough in the new intro continues to claim that these segments take place 66 million years ago, yet we're still seeing genre that likely died out by then. Shamosuchus, Velociraptor, Hesperornis, Pyroraptor, Tarkia, Kurukula, Imperibator, each of these are known from earlier rocks either during the Campanian or lower Maastrichtian ages. Now, some of these fossils are super fragmentary, and without a lot of specimens, we may not know exactly how long they lived, but if we're being conservative here, their inclusions are still inaccurate. Or, if you want to be generous, you can say that the intro is being inaccurate, and they shouldn't say 66 million years ago specifically, but maybe be more vague and say, towards the end of the Cretaceous, or something like that. That way, they can have their cake and eat it too. Since I mentioned an anachronistic velociraptor like the first season, we see a mishmash of Campanian Jaducta and Maastrichtian Namek formations, both from Mongolia, though at separate times. The earlier Jaducta, where we find Velociraptor, Protoceratops, Oviraptor, and so on, was a very arid desert. Afterwards came the Namek, where the creatures lived by river systems and forests. Yet, we see some of the Namek inhabitants living in what looks like the earlier desert biome. I called it out for season 1, but it only continues here. Velociraptors shouldn't be here, though it seems like too many were fawning over it to care. No! To make matters worse, the coordinated pack hunting trope has returned. In season 1, we saw these predators work together to bring down prey, like in non-educational pop culture depictions though lacing just enough doubt for the fanboys to come out to defend it. I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. As was common with each issue, yeah, an alarm is going off in the back of our brains, but because it's prehistoric planet and we're hyped for prehistoric planet, we'll simply ignore it. Well, not here. Badlands makes it abundantly clear how Velociraptors are playing 4D chess in order to catch Pronocephalae. Dromaeosaurids or Raptor Dinosaurs were not pulling out such pro-gamer moves when hunting. This is your final lesson! Ninja Kicks! Pack behavior is still very controversial. I even made a whole Paleomid video on it. Not to spoil too much, but it didn't fare too well. As for my last point here, I still have the pet peeve of Attenborough and the screenwriters using lazy dinosaur names. I you know, instead of saying the full genus name like Tyrannosaurus and Montosaurus Tarbosaurus, we keep getting hit with something sore. Like, bro, just say the name. Whether it was the pure dopamine inducing or the rage baiting, Prehistoric Planet 2 carries over a buttload of elements from the first. I'm a bit frustrated that the filmmakers couldn't just take the good and leave the bad. They chose to repeat both. But I gave number one an A minus, so clearly it was working already. Let's move on to features solely seen in our next go around, starting with the positives. Fortunately for us, we have many to cover. Something I love about this batch of episodes is how much they expand the roster. Before it felt like Pterosaur and Mosasaur Central. Meanwhile, several other remarkable lineages were MIA. That ends here with loads of new additions, causing the late Cretaceous to feel like a time with epic biodiversity. Snakes are introduced to Mad Soya, because yeah, these legless lizards popped up during the Cretaceous. For the first time, we're also shown mammals in Adelotherium, a member of the early group known as Gondwanatheres, endemic to the southern hemisphere. Australaptor is evidence that Baryonyx and Deinonychus were getting a bit too friendly together. These raptor dinosaurs were shown with a fish-eating diet, which seems accurate. Finally, in Season 2, Crocodilomorphs show up. You know, only some of the most charismatic and fascinating lineages of our past and present. 
Yeah, their absence last time was sorely felt during the 50th pterosaur bit. Simosuchus from Madagascar comes across as more of a weird armored dog. There's a dumb paleo myth, which may deserve a video someday, that crocodilians and their relatives haven't changed since the Mesozoic, which is so not true. Sure, the semi-aquatic ambush predator build has survived and reappeared for hundreds of millions of years, but crocodilomorphs have evolved into many wacky forms to occupy different niches. Simosuchus is a perfect example, developing a short snout and leaf-shaped teeth because they're supposed to be a vegetarian! <laughs> I've had my fill of mosasaurs since season 1, but Globidens is a welcome addition to the roster. I was just at the Smithsonian a few weeks ago, and seeing that gnarly skull with bizarrely bulbous teeth blew my mind. I definitely have a newfound appreciation for the animal and its inclusion as an invertebrate shell cracker. This is a freak of nature that shouldn't exist. Back in 2007, stomach contents from the predator were described containing clam shells. Globidens griefing some Cynodiscus ammonites is totally fair. Plus, I love the inclusion of a forked tongue again, emphasizing how these were basically big aquatic monitor lizards. While we don't have a tongue that I'm aware of, it's very plausible that this would have been present. A few old timers see some changes to their design, mainly in more splashes of color, which is a welcome addition. Usually this is added for the male, sticking with the trope of them being more vibrant than their female throw pillow loving counterparts as seen in the surviving dinos of today. Our favorite Hatseg Hunter is the best example of this, using his new colors to attract some female attention. It's all over in just a few seconds. Fastest man alive. Which might explain why you can't get a date. Yeah. Hey! We don't know for sure whether this was the case with the extinct dinosaurs and pterosaurs, though it can be reasonably inferred from evidence we have today. The modern dinosaurs do it, so maybe the dead ones did too. On screen are many impressive reconstructions of prehistoric behaviors that actually had me feeling like I was there in the end of the Cretaceous. Too many scenes were still just hunting and baby murder. I don't know, it still feels like the rioters looked at their segments and couldn't figure out how to make them interesting enough. So they kept turning to Old Reliable. What's your favorite food? Children. Oh. Baby as dark kids learning to fly? Well, that's not cool enough. Throw in some crocs for good measure. That's more of an entertainment writing critique. In terms of paleontology, okay, fair enough. Most critters were probably picked off as hatchlings and juveniles, with very few actually making it to adulthood. Our most indulgent moment when Isosaurus chicks are massacred by Rajasaurus does make sense. Large sauropods like this Titanosaurian probably didn't look after their young. Herds like this likely travel from place to place to find food, so they couldn't stay at a single nursery site. Sauropod nurseries aren't purely speculative either. Such nesting sites have been found all across the world, including India where this scene takes place. However, I believe it to be a specific reference to a find in Argentina, where heated volcanic soil was used to incubate the titanosaur eggs. Perhaps the long migration, along with some instinctual coordination around the poisonous gases, are more speculative, but we do know that relatives of the Isosaurus were doing something similar. I'm also an enjoyer of that Pachycephalosaurus scene in the Swamps episode, even if it doesn't take place in a swamp. Maybe Shrek kicked them out. This segment portrays two males fighting over dominance to determine who the real alpha is. Like we've seen before, it's a young upstart male taking on an established older dude. Nothing entirely original, but it is nice to see more Packies headbutting after a few years of experts questioning whether it was possible. If you've seen my recent paleo myths on the matter, you'll know that fossil evidence strongly supports it. Not to spoil too much of my video or ramble for too long on this topic, but the morphology of the dome heads share adaptations with modern striking bovids. To confirm this, we even have a high percentage of domed pachycephalosaurid skulls that show damage consistent with blunt force trauma as opposed to the flat-headed family members who lack such damage. The evidence is pretty much as good as it can get, which is why I gave the myth the 
Oh, uh, well, you'll just have to watch the video. We do get some flank butting and all around gnarly combat as well to satisfy that possibility. Though overall, the head butting is good. But wait, there's more. We don't just get one battle between a young, up and coming margin of Cephalian and a victorious, larger, established male. No, we get two. If I had a nickel for every time this happened... I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Audiences don't get the coveted Tyrant v Trike brawl, but the intraspecific clashing of heads is fun too, and just as likely. Triceratops skulls have been found with scrapes and rakes and holes consistent with horns coming at you. The match here displays interlocking horns, scraping and shoving, which fits well with the fossil evidence. Now, we view them in a large cluster of individuals, though our boy Attenborough makes it clear that this is a gathering for mating rather than a herd that typically lives together. In other ceratopses, such as Centrosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, we find massive bone beds of hundreds of individuals, though not in Triceratops. At most, we might find a handful of specimens together, perhaps representing a nuclear family. Perhaps. This acknowledgement of the fossil evidence, or lack thereof in the genus, may be an improvement from the first season. A few of my favorite segments though are when animals are just chilling, doing their thing because believe it or not, they don't spend the bulk of their time fighting. Seeing the Rapetosaurus take a mud bath, totally blocking our boy Beelzebufo, was a fun addition. Not only do the filmmakers feature acute behavior found in creatures today, but dang, I've never related to a frog harder. Poor guy was just trying to clap. I'm not sure if there's any direct evidence of such behavior, though it makes sense to help cool down and prevent bug bites. When it comes to problems, there's not much else for me to discuss that wasn't a holdover from the first season. Really, it's just a bit disappointing how the creators doubled down on some past flaws rather than correcting them. Aside from that, let's return to our Pachycephalosaurus. Everything I said before still holds up. I love its inclusion. But the look is not quite right. They're based off of the Sandy specimen, our most complete find of this creature to date. In our dino doc, you see the pronounced spikes jutting out the back of their heads, clearly indicative of this find. Not a problem, except the battle on display is clearly stated to be between a young male and an older dominant male. According to our current understanding of Pachycephalosaurus ontogeny, or growth, immature individuals wielded such gnarly spikes, though as they grew into adults, that bone resorbed back down until becoming the nubs we find in mature specimens. Sandy, as I'll call the fossil, represents a subadult or young adult, which is fine for the rival male, but a problem with the established Giga Chad. I'm aware that there's still research being done on the growth of these creatures, but due to my lack of omniscience, I can't see into the future to tell you the outcome. As far as flaws go, that's about it, unless I want to go into the deep depths of paleo lore to come up with some crazy nitpicks. However, I'd rather not become the biggest um actually online, so that's about all I got. After a good rewatch, I'm still of the opinion that this is a step up from the original. Prehistoric Planet 2 keeps much of what came before, for better and for worse, though adds plenty of welcome new material on top of that. Overall, it averages higher than the previous series, while being more enjoyable I feel. When it comes to accuracy, it becomes the modern gold standard, but still maintains notable flaws that keep it from rivaling National Geographic's bests. For that, Prehistoric Planet 2 deserves a very impressive A-. Well, this video was a long time coming. The writer's block was strong with this one since there wasn't too much that interested me here that I haven't covered before. If we get another full season, I hope we look back on a new time period with a new cast instead of seeing T-Rex and Mosasaurus again. Give me something new to discuss. Anyway, remember if you enjoyed this video to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.